Good evening and welcome to the American Farriers Journal Online Hoof Care Classroom. I'm Jeff Coda and I'm lead content editor of American Farriers Journal. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. We'll begin the webinar in just a moment, but first let me get a few announcements out of the way. This presentation will run about 50 minutes or so. We're going to do a, something a little different this time. Our presenter, Stuart Muir, will be discussing several case studies. At the end of each case study, we're going to open up a Q&A session for that particular segment. If you look on your screen, there's a control panel with a Q&A icon. Uh, you might have to move your cursor to the bottom of the screen for it to appear. You can submit questions here at any time during the presentation. And time permitting, we'll look, look to answer as many as possible. Uh, if you experience any technical issues, such as audio or with display, and I don't interrupt the presenter about the problem, the issue is likely on your end. And if for any reason your internet connection or, either, or even our connection should happen to fail at some point, and it looks like the webinar has been interrupted, just go back to the email that you received earlier telling you how to join the webinar, and you can re-enter the webinar. If the webinar session crashes for all of us, I'll relaunch the session and wait a few minutes for everyone to rejoin and then we'll pick up where the presenter left off. This presentation will be available on our website at AmericanFarriers.com after 7 p.m. tomorrow. Sponsoring the webinar is Soundhorse Technologies. After more than 20 years in hoof care, Soundhorse has pioneered glue-on shoes. Soundhorse glue-on shoes are designed by the Hall of Fame farrier Rob Sigafus, university patented, clinically tested and competitively proven. The only glue-on horseshoe to combine a forged aluminum shoe with a urethane shock absorbing rim pad and the strongest safety attachment system. A fast, reliable, proven way to shoe sore-footed sore horses or those with compromised hooves. Sound Horse is pleased to sponsor Stuart Muir's presentation. So with that, let's begin the webinar. Stuart, thanks for joining us, take it away. No problem, thank you. I'd just like to welcome everyone for being online and joining in, whether actually viewing this webinar this evening or in, in the future. Um, like Jeff mentioned, just a little bit of housekeeping at the end of, like you said, uh, there's gonna be a Q&A and the reason for that uh, after each chapter basically, because I'm gonna present you know six or seven case studies, just about how I navigate through different cases. So what we're gonna do at that point is we're gonna just almost pause the webinar for a minute or two to give you guys some time to get questions in. Um, and the reason for that is because each case study is so different that we wanna make sure that instead of me trying to get my way back through slides and so we can accurately kind of describe what, you know, what I saw and why I did it, hopefully we can just you know, access those um, pages a little bit easier. So if you see something, feel free to, um, you know, send a question through and I'll do my best to answer it. Of course, it's a little difficult sometimes um, if it's uh, about a different case uh, that I'm not presenting, you know, like sometimes um, some of the attendees like to ask questions about cases that, you know, uh, they're dealing with themselves. So I'll do my best to navigate that as well. Uh, I would like to thank the American Farriers Journal and Sound Horse. It's so good to have companies behind us that are helping us move forward as an industry. Uh, the, we're seeing huge movements um, at the moment in the fair industry um, to deal with products and just um, there's a lot more information sharing. So I'd just like to thank um, both them for that more and also for the opportunity. Um, when we're looking at uh, these case studies, um, it's important, we're going to do a little bit of like groundwork around them as well. Um, but it's also important to realize that these case studies are not a comprehensive way that we deal with these kind of issues all the time. Therapeutic shoeing is, uh, you know, there's just infinite possibilities. And, you know, although we may have some pathology in the limb, we could have opposing uh, hoof capsule diseases or confirmation that. So as much as I, I love to share ideas with people, I just want to say that, you know, like, um, by all means, steal my ideas. I've probably taken a few ideas of different people, but just be mindful that this is not necessarily the only way to do it. Um, so without any further ado, like, so just to kind of lay down some kind of ideas about the concepts around uh, therapeutic shoeing. When we therapeutically shoe a horse, it's, well, it's not because everything's going okay. You know, like the traditional mindset around shoeing you know, works very, very well for a high percentage of horses. But if you've been showing horses long enough, you know that 
Uh, eventually, things start changing. The hoof capsule is a very, very fluid kind of structure where we get a lot of distortions and a lot of migration of tissue and all that kind of thing. And that's without even looking at internal pathology. So this is one of uh, Paige Poss's images from Anatomy of the Equine. And, you know, it's just a really good kind of a look at the structures in behind the hoof capsule because quite often we can we shoe obviously the exterior of the foot but we're ultimately trying to influence the interior of the foot and if we can start to stimulate structures on the inside so i like this picture a lot because it kind of stri uh, strips everything back to basics um you know the blue is obviously collateral cartilages um but when we are dealing with pathology we're often dealing with um a hoof capsule that's in a distorted state so we almost have to uh think about shoeing that foot not for the foot that we're seeing, but the foot we want it to have. So we need to shoe with some, uh, you know, some symmetry in mind. We need to almost forget about some of the distortions we're seeing and shoe beyond them. Um, you know, we this uh, diagram here has been brought up a lot recently about you know the effects of excessive toe length and the lever arm getting longer around the limb, and this is very very important when it comes to internal compression within the hoof capsule. So you know from a you know, personally myself, I shoe around the center of rotation. Um, I'm not too concerned about hoof past and axis because I think there's numerous pathologies that can alter that, lax tendons, um, you know, tendons that are just too tight. So, you know, from a therapeutic shoeing perspective, I don't always try to fit my shoeing into a box. So, you know, we're very, very used to seeing these. We completely understand that the longer the toe length, the, the greater the lever arm. But you know, there's actually a lot more to the stride than that. So to run you through this diagram, the, the horse is basically, you know, running along the top of the screen and these diagrams here line up beautifully with it. And we can see that, you know, this blue line is the left front. So what we've got here is we've got horizontal, uh, vertical forces and we've got um, longitudinal forces that happen on the limb. So to kind of run you through this graph and kind of under help understand why you know, sometimes we need to almost picture frame the foot when we shoot. We need to kind of look past some of these distortions or negotiate our way around them. You know, these little lines here of the uh, right hind, the right hind is the orange line and the blue line is the left front. You know, here's the landing here. We can see that there's some vertical force. There's a lot more longitudinal force at that rate. But this, it's actually here where these two line up, where the horse moves over the top of the limb that I'm particularly interested in. Um, so, and that is ultimately, you know, gonna influence the way I look at uh, how I shoe these horses. Because although we have a lot of dissipating force, we also have a ground reaction force. And it, ultimately the hoof capsule kind of just molds around those two forces. So if we don't give offer the horse enough support, um, you know, the, the coffin joint can go into out of phase rotation instead of you know, like typically, you know, horses are toe landers. They like to lever off their toe. And horses actually have a higher lamella count in the toe region. And that's why we need that reinforced toe region. So, but, you know, there's been a lot of debate recently about, you know, is it leverage or is it support? But at the, at the first land or the second, sorry, the second landing phase where the horse's limb is actually deaccelerating, most of those forces are actually longitudinal. So, and also not just that, there's actually not a high force vector in them. So, but what I'm interested in particularly when I start shooting therapeutically is these two parts of the stride here, mid stance, when the limb is under peak load. Um, so that's when our deep digital flexor tendon is fully engaged. That's when our suspensory ligament is full of kinetic energy and it's looking to extend that. So although breakover is very, very important, breakover is actually on the other side of the hill down here. So the limb is already at breakover the, the limb has already passed all its maximum forces. So if ideally when we're shoeing, uh, especially we're shoeing with some symmetry and we're, you know, everything's trying to be balanced around uh, the coffin joint. You know, we want anterior posterior, we want a 50, 50 ratio to look at, but it's also important to think about where the fetlock or the carpus or the hock sits above that because with the fluidity of the hoof capsule, that is going to influence the hoof capsule shape. So if it goes lateral, we know we're going to probably, you know, we're going to get some uh, distortion on the lateral side because um, generally the quadrant under the most force of the hoof capsule is the most vertical. So, you know, um, confirmation 
it's so important when it comes to how we visualize these hoof capsules and how we want to negotiate our way around them. So here's just a, this is kind of like a case. We can see here that this is actually a right hind, uh, left hind actually it is. Um, and it's slightly fetlock varus. We can see that the, the frog is kind of angled through. Ideally, the, generally the, cent the central sulcus of the frog is gonna give us the, um, the angle of the coffin bone and it kind of exits the foot through the, just offset of the toe. But you know, here's the straighter inside wall. We can see that that medial hairline is punched up. And from the outside, we can even see it more, you know, we've got that crushing effect. So, um, and this is just from confirmation and where that fetlock sits above it. So when we put a horseshoe on, um, sometimes we have to look outside those distortions that we're seeing. And I'm ultimately, this is still what I'm trying to achieve. I not only want the, uh, the coffin joint anterior posterior balanced, but I also want some kind of balance because what I'm trying to offer these horses with um, severe hoof capsule distortions is uh, limb st stability. So when those horses are reaching that mid stance phase where those uh, peak forces are so high, what I'm trying to do is artificially support that limb in a way that almost as if that horse had a um, healthy hoof capsule. So here, this is how I'd kind of fit that foot. This is the same foot, so it was the left hind. Um, you know, and sometimes we've got a, I've left this shoe just a touch fuller from the almost just forward of the quarter and then left off the quarter on the side. And what I'm, this is kind of what I'm looking for is like if I was to run uh, an axial line through the limb and then, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my heel positioning uh, and, and just how that shoe ultimately complements that foot. So, you know, I'm not going to talk too much today about the anterior posterior shoeing around the center of rotation or articulation or whatever you will. Um, Today I'm kind of looking more at the, you know, how can we offer the limb the most stability and, and certainly complementing the limb with a, a well-balanced shoe um, can certainly help. So to put it into context, um, here's just a sh very short case study that I have. Um, we, you know, you could call this horse rotated out from the tarsus or cow hopped. Um, of course, as soon as we get that confirmation that's not a dead straight line, the hoof capsule is going to um, migrate and distort to support whatever force is the greatest basically. Um, so for this horse, the right hind become an issue. Um, we can see that that uh, lateral heel quarter just wants to kind of fold. We can see that the, uh, the horn quality is starting to kind of, you know, it's just not as healthy and as strong as we'd like it. And that's because of the forces acting above when this horse is in locomotion. So here's just a short video. Um, and it is only like five, odd seconds, six seconds long. But um, what I'm looking at uh, before I started is, if you can kind of just, I've got three shoes on the horse, I don't have the fourth shoe on the right hind. So we're looking at the hind and just how that horse places that limb and how we could then, you know, shoe this limb to complement it and give it more medial or lateral support. So we can see with that limb, what's happening is we're adducting towards the median line more so on the right hind than the left hind. So when you start to think about showing this horse and we take in the hoof capsule conformation that we're seeing, you know, it would make sense that if this side, the lateral side of the right hind is starting to contract under due to the forces from being cow hulked or rotated, that we need to almost, you know, certainly for a deformable substrate, we need a, a wider branch on the outside. We probably need to show it just a little bit more full than what we would. And so from the tarsus, we can drop those same symmetry lines and start to put that limb into, you know, like a box where we can, you know, as far as the central um, metatarsal is concerned, you know, we've got nice amounts of proportional support fit from our shoe um, that complements the hoof conformation um, due to the limb conformation. So, you know, really taking the time to look at the horse's conformation when we shoe these horses is so important because the, the dynamic and uh, static views that we get can be very, very different. Um, 
And another thing with that is we need to be very mindful about what kind of substrate these horses are going to be working in. You know, if this horse here was working in like a very, you know, on top of some blacktop, of course, any modifications, modifications as far as shoe width is going to be out the back door because, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to get that float we're looking for uh, that we would in a deformable substrate. So um, <clears throat> here's a, just another horse that I shod uh, a few years ago. And, you know, so I've just put these two pictures up to kind of, because I think it does show, you know, like the picture on the right is kind of the, the whole shoeing job looks kind of swept out to the lateral side. And I like to think that the job on the left is just a little bit more balanced through the center of the limb. Um, <clears throat> the same can be done, of course, for front limbs. Um, even more important, um, you know, the front end of the horse is going to take 62, 63% of the horse's weight. And that is why we see so much pathology up the front end. Um, so quite often you can see a lot of these pictures, I'm kind of citing them from the back of the limb. Um, I was lucky enough to work with Bobby Menker a, a few weeks ago and Bobby was, you know, he, we talked about this kind of conceptual shoeing and he would even put weight into the limb and see how the, the hoof capsule reacted after that. Um, we had a great day and talked about a lot of great things. Um, but it's really important, you know, but the same concepts still apply. We're still looking for the, the coffin joint in the center of the limb, anterior, posterior, medial, lateral. Uh, and we're certainly with a nice amount of length. Um, like I say, if we've got heel distortions, uh, if we're starting to shoot therapeutically, we need to start to look through those. So there's just the first small chapter. Um, if there's any questions, I'll sit here for a minute or two. And um, if you've got any questions about shoeing with symmetry, um, you know, I think a lot of us can, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, shoeing around the center of rotation and we talk a lot about, you know, uh, balance and that kind of thing. Um, it's so important to think about balance is, you know, um, I got asked a month or two back, you know, what is balance? And people start talking about hoof angles and you're like, well, that's not exactly balance. Um, balances is really about how the hoof capsule interacts with the ground surface and making sure that the the limb passing over the top is 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 supported um, and it has a sense of equilibrium about it where it, you know we've got enough support on that limb where it's not the coffin bones not going out of phase rotation into a negative you know palmar angle kind of capacity um, but on the other hand we haven't got it um, jacked too far forward either. Um, the same can be said for, you know, we're making sure that that foot is landing medial laterally well with the surface. So for me, um, balance is quite often, shoeing with symmetry is all about just a positive interaction with the ground surface, like an even distribution of force uh, from a dissipating uh, force and also a ground reaction force. Tim Shannon has a question. Can you explain the difference between vertical loading versus longitudinal loading? Well, I think it's, when we go about longitudinal, for me, that's, it's specific to the deacceleration phase of that limb. So it's when the limb is coming to a quick stop as the vertical is when the horse is passing over the top. So, you know, and I know there's a lot of debate about um, support or leverage. But when you've got maximum peak forces that are vertically induced, I think, you know, that's kind of, I think that's where we can offer the limb a lot of support is that that very quick deacceleration phase, the second phase of landing, you know, it's, it's really, you know, when the horse is deciding whether it's safe to move across the top of that limb or not. So, you know, I, I think there's still a sense of um, uh, that we need to offer the horse a well-balanced foot. Um, we don't, Everything needs to be kind of, when we're talking about conceptual ideas like this, it's so important to make sure we keep it in context where, you know, like, you know, horseshoeing, there's just infinite possibilities of, you know, of, of things that can happen. So when we start talking about theories or ideas that it's um, so important, you know, to certainly clinical evaluation of the horse, the confirmation, and that is, is really important. We have another question, uh, not, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, not quite sure how to phrase this, but in the ground force reaction graph, 
It seems to affirm Eddie Watson's theory that he desired a hoof to load flat rather than to land flat. Am I off base? It's really interesting, the, the land flat theory. Um, and it's, uh, you know, certain confirmation types, in my opinion, in my opinion only, are very, very difficult to get them to land flat. Um, and whether we're talking about like heel to toe, or whether we're talking about meteor lateral, like you rotated out horses, they have a tendency to, you know, load that lateral heel and then slam the medial heel down really heavily. Um, for me, as long as I've got that horse balanced, um, of course, I don't, I don't really want like uh, the toe landing first. I'd like a slight heel first landing. Slight, but, um, you know, you do get the ones that will just land nice and flat and the others that all kind of really put the limb out the front of the, of, the, of the body of the horse and load that heel. But, you know, if I do see an absolute toe, land, toe first landing, um, it certainly does raise my uh, suspicions about pathology. Um, we're going to kind of, we've got a case study of kind of that touches on that later on. Okay, I think that's all for the questions on this case study, Stuart. Okay, we'll move on. So <laughs> talking about confirmation and how it affects the limb, I think shared heels is a, um, certainly one of those kind of situations where confirmation can be really weigh quite heavily, uh, on the hoof capsule and can create some large distortions. And I think the shearing force is um, certainly one of those where confirmation is generally, it's a, like a, a sheared heel is just a symptom uh, of confirmation. Certainly in this case, I believe anyway. Um, <clears throat> I've only shod this horse four or five times. I got these radiographs sent to me and of course we can all appreciate that this horse is high, low, major hoof capsule distortions. Um, these are, you know, we've obviously got some kind of uh, delamination in the wall, some low grade chronic laminitis, you know, like where we've got things are just getting way out of control for this horse. Um, the uh, DP shots are showing, you know, almost like a, a quadrant imbalance for me when I look at these radiographs. The picture of the left hand side of your screen uh, is, of course, the left front. I, uh, no, don't quote me on that. Um, but we're just seeing, sorry, it must be right front. Uh, we're seeing, you know, like almost like a laterally high, but it's also tipped kind of to the medial toe quarter as well, which would be consistent with um, shed heel kind of disruptions in the hoof capsule. So the confirmation for this horse, you know, carpal valgus, uh, quite often if we see uh, deviations in limb confirmation, if we see a carpal uh, deviation, the, quite often the fetlock will respond to that because the growth plate and the fetlock sets up before the carpus. Um, so, you know, slightly carpal valgus on the right front as well, but nowhere near as bad. Uh, the, the high low is not terrible in this picture. It was certainly a lot worse when I first saw this horse. Um, so we've got a lot going on that left front limb. Um, this is what I was presented with. Interestingly, like the left uh, front was the worst carpal valgus, but the right front was the worst with the clinical examination. So when we look at any of this kind of like um, radiographs and that it's so good to get these horses feet in your hands um, and you know kind of evaluate them maybe perhaps this horse was trimmed or shot out of balance I know it's very controversial about how to trim these sheared heel horses um, some believe that dropping the inside and getting that you know the origin of growth equal will do it myself personally I pull a t-square on these horses and I balance them with the cannon bone the best I can um, you know, when we see deviations like this, of course, you, <clears throat> earlier on I mentioned about shoeing with symmetry. All well, this foot is just just migrating in underneath itself. We can see that all the collateral cartilage uh, is getting shunted up uh, on the medial side of the foot. You know, when I when I view pictures like this, I'm always super mindful about um, you know, although I can see these deviations from the outside, what does everything look like on the inside? So. Sometimes the easiest way to think about um, sheared heels is half a contracted foot, like this side here is not contracted and this side here is contracted. This side's not and this side kind of is. So, um, of course, here's a picture of the solar surface. Um, you know, obviously just huge distortions. This is the right front. Um, you know, we can see all this necrotic tissue build up. Uh, there's bruising all through the foot. And you know, when this is pre-trim on the left side and I gave it a, 
I trimmed it the best I could on the right and just tried to get some of these structures back to where I, to where I want them. Um, you know, the, the central sulk is the frog. It's, there's a lot of thrush in there because it's, you know, that medial side is shunted over and just kind of jammed it shut. So we've got that to deal with. So we've got a disease of the frog. So we've got to be careful about how we negotiate this because, you know, you know um, I put a heart bar on this horse, um, which can be contraindicated because, you know, you're loading a, a disease structure, but we, we've kind of, things can start contradicting themselves quickly if we're not careful and kind of, we've got to be always mindful about making sure we dot the I's and cross the T's to make sure these shoeings are um, successful. But one of the biggest things when we think back to the radiographs is how run forward these feet are. So if, um, I trimmed this horse with the mindset of a barefoot trim to try and leap behind as much foot mass as I can. You can see all the sole calluses is left in there. If, if the whole foot is unstable and it's got sheared heels, I want to make sure I'm not taking away any more rigidity out of that foot than I absolutely have to to try and offer that horse, you know, like something to walk on. So, you know, I've come really just rounded the toe off. I've come back inside the white line on this foot just to try and get some proportions right, get my anterior posterior balance right. Here's the shoe that I put on. Um, because the wall quality was so compromised, um, I really didn't want to, um, I, you know, I didn't want to, there just there wasn't really enough for me to think that I could really safely nail this horse, so I indirectly glued it. Um, I incorporated the cuff system, um, basically just the, the idea with the shoe is it was going to allow me to float the medial quarters, load up on that frog a little bit. You can see that I've I actually flossed the central sulcus with thrush buster um, to try and make sure we're trying to take care of that disease roof capsule as well as we went. At the bottom of the picture here, you can kind of see these heel bulbs just poking out just here. So although this horse is, you know, when we saw the sole of view of this horse, everything was kind of pushed forward and weak. I've kind of basically just, you know, put a picture frame around that foot and just given it some symmetry. Uh, so here's the left front, <laughs> completely different kind of um, foot, same uh, because it's a high foot. This is our post trim, obviously, and I've, I've obviously got enough thrush buster here to take care of that uh, central sulcus as well. Um, the most interesting thing about this horse is the, sh uh, the shed heels are kind of interesting for me at times because I, I seem to notice them a lot, like uh, race horses get them a lot. Um, and I think what the reason for that is they're confirmation based, but then also on top of that, the hoof capsule is, is really poor integrity. You know, there's not a lot of wall structure. Your collateral cartilages aren't very strong. Um, so the whole, the whole back half of the foot isn't very robust. So it's very malleable to force. Um, and that's one of the hardest things. So as far as the shoeing prescription goes, offering rigidity and a heart bar make a lot of sense. So here's the, uh, back to the right front, the second time I shot this horse. And I think we can appreciate that, you know, like that medial heel is already starting to drop. I floated this horse, um, you know, three sixteenths of an inch uh, on the medial side. And, you know, I did load that frog um, almost with a neutral pressure. Uh, I'm very careful when I start loading structures, um, sp certainly with heart bars. I, I tend to break those down into three heart bar pressures into three pressures. Uh, negative pressure is no contact. Neutral pressure is when you put the shoe onto the heel, it just kisses the frog. Uh, and then positive pressure, which would be actually, you know, both heels would be floating off the shoe. Um, and horses with poor uh, wall and sole quality, I think we need to be careful about, you know, like we've all heard that occasionally heart bars get a bad rep, but I think it's the application of these. So, you know, if you haven't had a lot of experience, Putting on these heart bars, I just suggest you get with someone that has and, and kind of run you through it. There's a few ways to, um, to adjust your heart bar pressure. Quite often what I'll do is I'll take the bearing surface to my grinder if I feel that I've got too much heart bar um, pressure and I'll actually grind the back of the heart bar off until I'm comfortable with, um, with how much pressure I've actually got there. So, But I think we did see a um, significant improvement in this medial heel here. Um, we can still see all this necrotic tissue on the lateral side. Um, and there's obviously a lot of bruising starting to come through. But like little glimpses of wool quality starting to improve, getting the heels back into a better position. We can see that that medial heel was shunted forward. Um, but we're starting to get things back into a little bit more symmetry. Here's just a short video to show you how, how weak this horse's foot was. This is the left front. So you could displace these heels with very little force at all, you know, one-handed, 
Um, so it, like I say, I think a lot of it's got to do with um, confirmation and then poor foot quality and we get these um, shared heels coming up. But um, you know, you, you can offer these horses quite a lot more comfort. So here's the indirect uh, glue application from the back of the foot. Um, I've got my heart bar pressure where I want it. You can see that the shoe is actually sitting a little full on this inside, but if we drop a straight line down from the coronet band, everything's nice and lined up. And what I've actually done is when I put the shoe on, you can see the right front's wrapped in plastic. I'll, um, uh, there's a wrapping technique we use um, to get these positioned just right. But once you've got enough wrap on the foot, uh, for really sore horses, these shoes are great because you can put the limb down while the glue sets up, which is a really nice thing. Um, so I've just pushed some glue around to box off that side of the foot to make sure, you know, this horse isn't going to grab it. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping that I forgot at the start of this webinar. Essentially, this webinar is part one of two. Uh, sorry, part two of uh, cause Sound Horse a year ago, actually, and the Farrier's Journal. Um, we did another web uh, webinar more based on the basics uh, of how to apply these shoes and the preparation and all that. So if you haven't caught that webinar up, I would encourage you to do so before you kind of just run away with a few of these ideas and um, because the application for how we get these shoes on is so important. Um, you know, there's a process that I go through to get these on. Uh, that other webinar um, also shows the wrapping technique I use for the indirect gluing method um, because these are uh, these cuff style shoes. They can have a tendency to kind of get away on you when you wrap them. They'll kind of, if you wrap them medially, they'll push laterally and it can kind of end up a cluster. You really almost want to shrink wrap these shoes on. Uh, but that other webinar will go through all that. It'll go through um, direct applications and it'll also go through indirect applications of glue on shoes. So here's uh, the left front on the third exam. The whole hoof capsule is looking a lot better than what it was. Sorry about the picture on the left. It's just a touch blurry, but sometimes you're in the moment showing the horses and you're trying to, you're trying to snap these pictures the best you can. We can see the central sulcus is still, you know, still we've still got some fungal or bacterial invasion in there. This heel here, we've still got a little bit of work, but the heels are starting to even out. Um, so once I start to see progress with these horses and they let me know I'm moving in the right direction, then I'll, I'll continue on. If, you know, if, if anything, if the shoeing prescription was starting to contradict itself, where the horses the loading of the frog wasn't doing so well, what I, I'd have to start thinking about another uh, another option. But you can see the wool quality here is really starting to improve, um, just with a little bit of load shearing on the frog and using this glue on method. Um, here is the right front on the third exam. We can see the heels here have really started to even out, um, and I believe that's because the limb conformation on top of it is. Is, was so much better than the left front. Um, when I see horses like this um, start to profuse sole, it gives me a lot of hope. You know, I'll trim these horses um, and leave all the sole callus and I'll just trim everything flat and offer that horse or offer that hoof capsule some more rigidity through the foot. Um, we can see that the frog is getting healthier. We've got, we've got good tissue. We've still got a little bit of bruising, absolutely, but this is this bruising is a few months old and it's actually just making its way to the surface. Um, and still, this is a very, very asymmetric foot, um, but we're starting to see improvement. The wall quality is improving. Everything's looking better. Um, I haven't had to nail this foot. Now, keeping the shoes on these, you know, the indirect cuff systems are like nine times harder to pull off than a traditional nail on shoe. So um, this horse actually as a point was, um, actually lives about two hours from me. So it's nice when I jump back in the truck and I can, I know I've got those shoes secured on well enough. My hoof pre preparation on that, on that limb is right, that I know it's still going to be there um, when I return. So here's just the third exam. Uh, Palmar dorsal view on the both. Uh, I switched out to some thrush buster. Um, no, sorry, uh, Kevin Bacon, I think it was this time, um, thrush treatment. Just a little bit of coronitis, I thought, in there. Um, at this point, because I've had a lot of change in this foot, it's about time to retrace this foot. Um, we've got two fabricators at the clinic that make these shoes for us. Um, so what we'll do is we'll trace the horse's foot, we'll take it to them, give them the instructions about what we exactly we want, um, and we'll go from there. So at this point, I probably I did retrace this horse uh, for showing the next time, but we can see that these heels are a long way from where we started. Um, so there's just a comparative 12-week cycle on the right front. So 
you know, in 12 weeks, it's amazing, you know, just the difference you can make. All these hair follicles are starting to sit down nicely. It lets me know that the limb is a lot more, you know, settled when, you know, those maximum peak forces are influencing the hoof capsule. So, you know, it's not a bad, it's a good case study based on 12 weeks. Um, here's the left front, which is interesting um, because I thought I would have, you know, we, there was no doubt that the limb conformation on the um, left front was worse. Um, we did get certainly some improvement, but not as much as the right front. And it's interesting because the right front was so much worse. I would have thought it would have taken a long time to get together, but I, I really do just put that down to the, um, to the limb conformation we had. Um, and I think ultimately that's what is influencing this medial heel. So, you know, and the last time I showed this horse, I still pushed on and, um, uh, continued to float these medial heels. I'd really like them nice and even and just, you know, this hairline here looks really nice and settled. Um, I'd like them both to be the same. Interestingly enough, over the winter, I had a few horses like this and, you know, certainly around the Kentucky, Cincinnati area, um, we had a lot of rain over, you know, winter, a lot of soft ground conditions and horses with um, less than perfect, uh, which I mean, it's a long shot getting perfect comp uh, limb conformation anyway. But um, with the softer, deformable mud that, you know, some of them were walking in, I had a few of these little quarter cracks actually pop up that I actually thought were interesting. And I, I credited those, um, the large majority, just to um, the ground reaction force and how it affected the, and limb conformation, how those two affected each other and possibly put this horse um, just a touch out of balance and maybe enough to pop a quarter crack. So if there's any, uh, questions about that case study, uh, feel free to jot them down. If not, we can, um, you can certainly ask questions at the end, right at the end of the webinar. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> we have one question. I believe it was regarding the uh, horse, the first horse with the sheared heels um, at, at, toward the beginning. Um, uh, how long was it since the horse was last shod when the, when the uh, photo was taken? Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, it looked in a fairly neg neglected case, you know, way to me. Um, I was just presented that horse and, you know, at a barn, a, a jumper barn that I shoe at. And I kind of just, I, the only thing I asked for was radiographs and we pushed forward from there. And how happy were you with the thrush buster treatment of the central sulcus? <laughs> I was, I was fairly happy. Um, I used, like I say, I used a couple of different treatments in there. Um, I know uh, Keramend also do one. Um, but what I do think is really important is getting to the base of those. Um, you know, there's plenty of pictures that have been floating around the internet about, you know, the actual, what the basis of those um, central sulcuses look like when they have thrush. And, you know, it, um, I think we need to be quite mindful of, you know, how painful those are for the horse. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll actually get a piece of four by four gauze and floss um, the central sulcus with thrush buster or the Kevin Bacon product or Keramend or whatever it'll be. Um, but what I will say is if I'm not getting a, a decent response from one of those products, I'll, I'll, to be honest, I'll flick to another one and see if that hits it. Cause I think sometimes you can have a higher bacterial count in some central sulcus and sometimes you can have a higher fungal count. So whatever your topical is, um, you can certainly try different ones and just see if one is more effective. But of course, we've also got to change the environment the horse is in. You know, if, if that horse is standing in mud all day or a, a dirty stall, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty contraindicated. We're not going to get a lot of um, relief from that. And have you been able to address the, uh, the length of the toe on the horse? I did. I addressed the length of the toe really quickly. Uh, that's why I adopted the barefoot trim. Um, and I, at that point, the hoof distortion was so great that, you know, the, the hoof capture was lying to me as far as what it was trying to tell me where the white line, I think everything was just so stretched forward that I, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't hesitate in addressing that toe. Um, I, what I did do though, was I rounded it up from the bottom. I did not take all the integrity out of that dorsal wall. And I think that's fundamental when we do see horses with severe distortions like that, that we, are careful that, and we almost approach those cases in a more pragmatic sense um, because, you know, there's a huge influence in the fair industry to, to um, 
have a very aesthetically pleasing job, but if it's, if it's not actually going to help the horse over a long term process, like, so what I'm trying to do with these is knock proportions back into place and get myself together a stronger, more rigid hoof capsule and then move from there. So it's important that we don't just, you know, like see huge distortions like that and not, you know, just rasp right through that dorsal wall. Um, and the more proximal region of the foot, we want to, we want to make sure that um, there's some foot left for that horse to run on. Okay, that, that's the end of the questions for this part of the case study. Okay, we'll move on. So um, I kind of briefly touched on quarter cracks uh, in that uh, last case study. So we'll move on with that theory. Um, <clears throat> I think quarter cracks, I think there's numerous different ways for quarter cracks to, to come about. Um, I do see this happening a lot as the end of the shoe lines up with kind of around the um, the origin of the quarter crack. We can, you know, and also at the, um, I think Scott Lambert called them the push pull quarter cracks where everything pushes up then, you know, they push out and it's essentially that's what starts these quarter cracks. But I think some of them is just a basic, you know, vertical leverage where, you know, the back half of this foot here is just hanging over the back of the shoe. And this is why I brought up like shoeing with symmetry earlier because you know this hoof comp, well, this heel conformation is not in its original place. So when I'm shoeing horses, uh, quite often I'm trying to think about, uh, as far as heel structure goes, where where would the the or, you know the natural origin of this heel be? And it's certainly not this far forward or this high off the ground. So I do see that relationship there with quarter cracks. Um, another image from Anatomy of the Equine and. Um, uh, Paige does a great job on um, giving us really detailed images of and just how things are, how she finds them. She does obviously a lot of dissection and high quality photography of these limbs. And she, you know, her, I know for a fact her um, online courses are, are just really in depth. And it's so good to have it in a way that we can visualize it. We could do a dissection of ourselves and see it in the same context instead of illustrated in a book. Um, but you know, as far as, a, um, you know, deviations in the wall, the reason I've, I grabbed this picture from Paige was just to show that, you know, what we see on the outside is not necessarily what we see on the inside. You know, we can see this bacterial tract moving in here and actually <clears throat> the next picture here is just wonderfully shows the scarring of the, um, of the lamella bed. So, you know, of course the lamella bed um, is highly vascular, and you know it's a, essentially a highly vascular ligament structure that interdigitates the coffin bone to the wall. Um, but I think what Paige has done a great job of showing is just, you know, we assume from the outside that you know it's just a quarter crack. But you know that she's showing she's shown me showing me a few pictures now of lamella scarring, and it's just more more, more like a higher fibrous count. Um, where it's just not as perfused as what I wants for. And that made a lot of sense to me because I've, I was showing a horse recently with them. Um, it started out with five quarter cracks and I got four of them under control and I found out the fifth was environmental and we put a plan in place to take care of that. Um, but there's still one spot on that horse's foot that continues to crack once a year. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that, you know, that horse has lamella scarring through that region. So, you know, for farriers that are, that have, um, you know, a, a chronic quarter crack horse that just continues to crack, continues to crack. We've got to be careful that, you know, it's not like we can just open the side of the hoof capsule and go, oh, this horse has lamella scarring. But I think it's certainly something that we need to think about um, when we see, when we do see these chronic quarter crack horses. So it's always about how to navigate these. Uh, here's one I ran into at a show. Uh, this is the, I literally strip everything off the foot uh, that, that it had on and just snapped a picture of it. Um, of course, we can see two quarter cracks are, uh, lying right next to each other. Um, so they can be a little bit difficult to navigate. Um, when I'm on the road shoeing horses, like I know a lot of us are on the road shoeing horses, sometimes it's literally what you've got in the back of the truck, you might not be prepared for a, a quarter crack. But once you understand the concept of load shearing and, um, and a few other fundamentals about um, putting together a therapeutic shoeing prescription, you know, once you're in a load shearing capacity, you're fine. Like, so um, I decided to load shear this horse with a aluminum spider plate and then take away part of that spider plate and, and use that to float the quarter. Um, I used the, 
I'm basically offsetting the load sharing capacity that you would with a heart bar with the rigidity of, of a spider plate underneath. Um, and then I'd fill it with some impression material like Ecopack Flex or something like that, where I can choose the durometer rating of how stiff I, I think that horse could handle and how much load sharing I can do. Um, but once I've got <clears throat> that quarter floated, then it's time to dream all these cracks and start to get a little bit creative about navigating them. So I think it's really important to, um, there's different cracks for me, there's full thickness cracks and then more superficial cracks. You know, this one here, the more anterior one was certainly a full thickness. And this was maybe a little bit older. It wasn't quite at the hair line. Um, maybe it was somewhat resolved, but because it was there and there was a weakness there, I, I, was, I just got after them both. And um, so dremeled them out, backfilled with uh, uh, copper sulfate, uh, lanolin um, kind of um, product, um, and then laid myself a couple of drains over the top. When I'm on the road and shoeing horses, because um, what I do at the hospital is therapeutic sport horse kind of work. Um, sometimes I'm put in a position like this where I, I do need to leave the show. I can't, you know, go and check on these horses. Um, so, you know, luckily for me, this quarter crack wasn't bleeding when I got there. So it, it kind of made me confident enough that I, I felt that I could prep the foot. If I was careful about how I went about it, um, it made me confident that I could leave the show. Um, so what I actually did then, the, the hoof capsule on here was pretty compromised. The, there wasn't a lot of integrity of wall up here. You could manually palpate that wall. Um, and I think that's why, you know, this quarter crack had popped. Um, so what I actually did is because there wasn't enough wall quality to um, actually drill through the wall, what I did was uh, I got some Cobra socks and uh, methyl methacolate glue and I uh, just made myself little pillars and then I actually stitched those pillars together. So what I'm doing here is in reinforcing, if I've, if I've got poor wall quality, I wanna aid that foot and have better wall quality. So, or even if it is artificial. So at just a couple of points, um, you know, this is a show horse, this horse continued to show, but it's really important due to interference and in building these pillars up that we keep everything as low profile against the hoof capsule as we can. Um, what I did was I daisy chained these uh, stitches together um, and it, you know, and then what I do is I get all my wires sitting in there and um, I will generally I'll do the foot unweighted and I'll, I'll twist those wires together with a pair of needle nose vice grips and I'll just wait for them to tighten. I don't want to, I'm not pulling uh, the quarter cracks together, I'm almost making like a hammock that when that collateral cartilage pushes out, that it's pushing into a more solid structure. Um, once I've got my stitching done, I'm going to backfill again with uh, this keramine copper sulfate paste. I like this, it just, you know, we've got to be careful we don't chemical burn these horses or put anything too caustic on them. Uh, the other thing that I'm very careful about is making sure that this, this patch is set really high. Uh, you know, these quarter cracks originate at the hairline, so that's where I want to address them from. Um, you know, I've got some mechanics sitting in those shoes. Um, once I've got, once I've reapplied that uh, keramine paste, I'm going to set up my drains again. You know, there's so many ways to set up drains. This is just some um, white medical tape folded in thirds with some more oily paste across the top of them. As long as they can pull out from underneath the, your patch and you're fine. Uh, and then I'll use some polyvectrin usually. And, um, and what I'll do is I'll just create a, you know, like a cover over the top of it. So, you know, I've got my drain sitting in there. I've got my wires underneath there. And this is just to keep everything safely intact. Um, and you can see again, I think this, this picture here might be the second time I um, stitched this horse. Um, due to the fact there's two, um, two cracks, I probably did stitch it two or three times. We can see that that hairline has started to even out. We haven't got that, you know, that slumping over the end of the shoe anymore. Uh, you know, wall quality is starting to improve, but I still went about it the same way underneath. This foot is still in a load sharing capacity with those two quarter cracks floated. Um, here's a few months later, still in a stabilizer plate, um, but it not floated anymore. And it always interests me because, you know, like you see this kind of necrotic wall tissue come down and I'm always interested in why, you know, we get that necrotic kind of, you can see there's the top of that more anterior uh, quarter crack and the, the, the top of that second one. So they've literally just grown out in line with, the, with those uh, horn tubules, but you know, the foot's doing a lot better. Um, and you know, working at the hospital, I always like to eventually hand these horses back over 
uh, to the original farrier if I can. Um, and that's what happened with this case. And that farrier is doing a great job with it. And this horse hasn't recracked since. Um, so I think a lot of it, we've got to look at the integrity of the hoof um, and address that. It's like, why are we getting these cracks? If it's just poor integrity, well, we need to support that. We can do that from underneath the foot and then you know, put our patches in place. So if there's any questions about that case study, I'd be happy to. Yeah. Um, is there a, uh, we have a question from a gentleman who um, is a living historian and does uh, uh, fairy out at reenactments uh, like Civil War and that sort of thing. And um, he was wondering if there's a simple way to fix a quarter crack in the field. He has to do some of these quick fixes from time to time. Yeah, um, I've got another case study coming up, and I'll show you that. Excellent. Um, on the horse with the double quarter crack, what shoe did you, did you use, and why did you make that choice? Uh, a lot of it for that horse is I was at a horse show, and I really just had to, um, I had to pull something out and use it. Um, the shoe itself, it, just an aluminum keg shoe, um, and then the, the stabilizer plate. You could have used a heart bar shoe, um, I've also used, it's important we get to the origin of the quarter crack. Why I, I see quarter cracks as a symptom. So sometimes it can be confirmation. Sometimes it can be poor wall quality. You know, I've had another horse that had contracted heels and, um, I fixed that horse with polyurethane shoes and, um, like and a poor and orthotic. And the reason why that worked, because instead of treating the symptom, I got after the cause, the cause of that quarter crack was contracted heels that basically we had a, a natural center of pressure movement change and the heels were stacked a little bit, overloaded the heels, popped a quarter crack. So in fact, I just shot that horse today. Um, but you know, so for that horse and this is why it's, a, I mentioned at the start of this webinar that it's making sure that it, you know, this is not a comprehensive way to how to fix every quarter crack. It's how I fixed that quarter crack. But here, here's a few things that I saw along the way. And this is what influenced me in that direction. So for this horse, you know, it didn't need, uh, it wasn't really in a contracted state, so polyurethane shoes weren't going to work. Um, for this horse, it just needed some rigidity on the bottom of the foot that the, stabil uh, the stabilizer plate offered. In the later picture, the hairline appears to slump at the heel end again. Is that a problem starting up again? Yeah, I wondered about that too. I saw that myself. Um, I, I don't really know why. It could have been the horse had a slightly longer shoeing cycle. Um, I. I still shoot at the same barn that that horse is at and I do keep an eye on it. Um, it's one of those ones where, you know, again, earlier on in the um, webinar, I mentioned that, you know, it's so important that sometimes we see beyond the heels for what they are, but what they should be or could be, you know, we're showing with symmetry. We're finding where would be the origin of that heel structure if, if it was healthy. So, you know, I, um, if I was being a little bit tough on myself, I would probably say I could have offered that horse a little bit more length in that last shoeing. Uh, which acrylic do you prefer for patching? I think as long as, you know, for me, uh, I just like methyl methacolates. There's, um, there's a lot of different companies offering them. Um, it just seems like a really good solid glue to use, which is ba a basic aviation glue. As it relates to the sheared medial heels, uh, what, what would be the ultimate goal when shoeing these horses as far as the shoe type? Will you leave them in a therapeutic type heart bar or float and float the heels or try to move back to an open heeled shoe? shoe? I'd like to get a barefoot. <laughs> barefoot would be wonderful. I think barefoot sometimes is some of the quickest ways to get some of these hoof distortions out of the hoof capsule. Um, not always possible for some horses. Um, I'd like that horse to go into a open heel keg shoe at some time. All right, that's the end of the questions for this part of the case study. Okay, we'll move on. Um, navicular syndrome is uh, an interesting one. Uh, when we think about navicular, it's, you know, it's a term that's used a lot. Um, we've got to be really careful about what kind of navicular we have. You know, we've got sclerotic bone, kind of, we've got, you know, adhesions from the deep digital flexor tendon, we've got bursa, we've got all these different things. And um, sometimes as fairies, we can be very quick to just, you know, we put our hoof testers across the frog and we're like, oh, it's got navicular because we've got positive reaction across the frog. 
um, certainly working at the hospitals put me in an environment where I'm a little bit more cautious about making quick judgments like that. Um, because I think, you know, there's a sense of, you know, what's doing, you know, as far as we, we need to make sure what we're doing is right for the horse. And this is just a, a really good case. Dr. Bolker has done some really great work on uh, identifying different possible causes um, for navicular syndrome due to, you know, like collateral cartilage, uh, mass um, integrity, basically, and also digital cushion. Interestingly enough, the horses with, um, here's a little pocket of um, navicular horses right here with really poor um, digital cushion and also really poor um, collateral cartilage health. So what he is kind of indicating here is that navicular can be, you know, almost, it's a destination of poor um, back half of the foot quality where, you know, the, the structures in the back half of the foot aren't, they're, they're basically the, de the demise towards navicular. So if you're interested in more about navicular, Dr. Bulk, it can be really good to, to reference and, and read. When we are, when we put the hoof testers on, uh, you know, uh, these navicular style horses, of course, you know, we've got dissipating force uh, and green would be the ground reaction force. So sometimes the, the, I'm always interested in the origin of pain. Where is this pain coming from for this horse? So, you know, sometimes we need to eliminate ground reaction forces to make these horses comfortable. So this case was presented to me with, um, I was kind of shooing it on and off. The veterinarian and myself weren't kind of liaising that well um, in, into practice kind of thing. And eventually we, um, I put the hoof testers on myself. This horse is lame for two or three months. Bilaterally as well, which kind of got my interesting. I put the hoof testers on and um, this horse went through the roof. And um, this owner was really good. Because of my suspicions, I suggested the MRI and the owner went that way, um, which is wonderful because it gives us a very definitive answer about what's going on for this horse. Um, so I've got a, a very short video of how, this, how lame this horse was. And this is what we were seeing bilaterally. You know, this horse is just not generally doing very well. Um, so the MRI results basically were saying that impar ligament it was strained or inflamed. Uh, the navicular bone had some moderate thickening. Um, dorsal fibrillation of the deep digital flex center that was located against the proximal navicular bursa region. So everything's kind of pushing towards soft tissue navicular. So sometimes when we're we talk about navicular, we, you know, it's all like, oh, we've got bone spurs or we've got this or that, but we've got to be so careful that we're, that we're not looking at a, at a ligamentous problem or, you know, um, inflamed navicular bursa or, or so many things. So at this point, you know, like as soon as I get that positive reaction across the frog, I want diagnostics. I want to know because as this case goes to show on, as we move forward, the diagnostics were integral and, and figuring out what exactly we were going to do with this horse. So um, once we had the MRI results, I put on aluminum wedge shoe uh, or a graduated shoe. I think we wedged it up three to, just under three degrees. Uh, I wanted to de uh, decrease the compressive force over the uh, navicular region. Uh, a heel plate was added to, re uh, to reverse the ground reaction forces in the back half of the foot. And I also put some... Um, uh, mechanics into the shoes. Sorry, I'm back. I just had to mute just for a second. Um, <clears throat> and here's the MRI result. We can just see the inflamed impar ligament there a little. Um, we've got a little bit of signal here. Obviously, the whiter uh, contrast is where we're picking up signal. Um, so here's the shoe that I put on. Um, when we think about uh, ground reaction forces, if I can uh, deflect those away from the, the sore region, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm looking to protect the structure at this point. Um, here's the deep digital flex tendon that courses down the back of the navicular bone. If I wedge that up, I can decrease the tension in it and then de also de uh, decompress the compression over the navicular area. Um, so it's always important that, you know, when we are putting modifications on horses that we're careful about, we are, the fact that we, whether we're loading structures and when we wedge a foot up, of course, we're moving the center of pressure posterior in the foot. We've got to make sure that that's possible for that foot. The, the foot is structurally strong enough to handle that. 
making sure we're getting the soundness that, and support and protection that we want. Um, also, when, when I'm covering up structures with heel plates, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, it may be a thrust treatment. Or what I've been using recently is um, actually just some super glue with some finely ground copper sulfate just to hold some medication against these areas that I, I won't be able to access for the next four weeks. Um, what I've used here is just some, some soft uh, impression material underneath my heel plate. And that's just to offer even more, just a nice soft, almost caressing against that navicular region that doesn't like um, any ground reaction forces or hoof testers across it. Um, I find at the hospital we use this kind of shoe a lot for uh, these horses that are sore in that region. It makes a lot of sense with, with favorable ground reaction forces upon loading. You know, the navicular bone's going to sit in here. Uh, we've got it all nicely covered up. We're deflecting ground reaction forces. We've wedged the foot up. We're decreasing compression from the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, just one thing about the, you know, these impression materials, it, it's super important that the durometer rating or the shore rating of these is correct for the horse. Um, they come in all sorts of densities. Some are more, de uh, uh, more stable than others. Um, and what I mean by that is um, the hot, colds, but uh, the Equipac Flex is really good. Um, the temperature range that it's stable over is really, I mean, it's a, I can't quite pull the numbers off the top of my head, but it's, it's quite significant about the temperatures that we get in America. So what I typically do when I'm using this impression material, because it's, you know, the impression material is trying to set up, is I'll drive a couple of heel nails in, wrap it in plastic wrap and put the foot down and actually let the foot self level. Um, back into the shoe and that makes just helps me uh, readjust my medial lateral balance into the shoe um, So because this was a ligament strain it it really did change the way we address this this uh, horse's rehabilitation So, you know if this was bony navicular We probably could have shot it the same way and just carried on but because it was a ligament strain this horse went into extended stall rest for 16 weeks and I think this is a really fundamental case study when we're looking at you know, the vet relationships, relationships, because without the information of um, the diagnostics, quite possibly I would have done the wrong thing by this horse. So that's kind of what I've just put here in the summary that, you know, it could have been easily confused for typical caudal heel pain. Um, so just, just something to think about next time you are dealing with a, a navicular horse. And here's just a short video of the horse just after, I didn't even think at this point the horse had made 16 weeks stall rest. Um, but like, because we had the right information and we knew that obviously this horse has put on medication as well. Um, you know, we could make a huge difference in this horse's life um, just by having all the information together. Another way that I will uh, get around some navicular horses um, or horses that don't like a lot of um, frog contact is I'll, I'll wedge them up. It's, I think it's super important that we offer them some soul support when we do wedge these structures up so they don't prolapse, the frog doesn't prolapse through. But what I've been doing recently is um, just cutting the Yapora and orthotic away from the frog. Um, you just gotta be careful when you do it. Like I use a um, porin that's nice and pretty much crystal clear where I can see the frog underneath it. And I'll heat up a towing knife with my propane torch and I just cut that material away. So I've had a lot of success doing this as well. And if there's any questions, we could. Yeah, do you find overuse of copper sulfate to be counterproductive in long-term use, especially in full padding applications? I haven't seen anything yet. I've seen, a, I've used it a lot. And, you know, sometimes with those really tricky horses, you think, well, if a little bit is good, more is better. Um, and I've had it to the point where it's leached pretty well into the sole and all that kind of thing and really left um, that turquoise staining um, and I haven't seen a lot of down, no, no real downsides of it yet, but that's not to say that uh, it's not possible. What's the advantage of cutting away the pore pad around the frog? Does that leave the frog off the ground? It will leave the frog off the ground. And so basically you're floating the frog because that horse also was wedged up. So it's really important that we understand that when we do wedge these horses up, you know, that we're essentially elevating the back half of the foot further off the ground, which kind of challenges the central aspect of the foot. And so a horse with, you know, not a lot of 
foot integrity, they can tend to prolapse through the center of the shoe. Um, so if I'm wedging a horse up myself, I'm always offering some kind of sole support. So with showing those pictures, really all I'm looking to do is kind of give people some different ideas of navigating these things. Another one would be, you could use that for, would be um, if the horse had thrush and you didn't want to cover it over. That way, you know, you can cut it away and still get your topical treatments on that compromised frog. Does the frog want to prolapse when you cut away the poor pattern? It doesn't seem to. I think, I think we're load shearing well enough with uh, the sole that I haven't seen any, any indication of that at all so far. Okay. That looks like it's the end of the questions for this part. Cool. Um, so as an extension, um, temporary orthotics can be really good to use. Um, I use these a lot in my higher end sport horses where um, of course, when we put a bar on a horse at ground level, you know, like a heart bar or a straight bar, we lose a certain amount of traction. So it can be a little bit difficult to get these, um, those appliances on horses. But once we understand the concept of load sharing and, you know, when I do full clinics, it's a little bit hard to kind of pack everything into a one or odd hour webinar like this. But once we understand the concept of load sharing and a few other shoeing principles, we can start to kind of bend the rules a little bit and understand that we don't actually need permanent load sharing in there. We can use temporary orthotics with um, just impression material. And generally what I'll do with that is I'll, um, I'll put the impression material in and just wrap it in some vet wrap, wait for it to set up. And then you can just, what I'll generally do is um, <clears throat> my higher end sport horses that are in this kind of setup is uh, I'll talk to the trainer and I'll be like, Hey, can we get this horse in their temporary orthotics? 14 hours a day can we get them in 20 hours a day what can we do and i'll just um i'll just kind of negotiate the best i can but you know when the horses go out to compete the train is generally happy because you know we use these in race horses a lot as well because they've got an open heel you know rim shoe on but we've got the option of um some additional sole support if we need it i know that's no a really question. brief case study, but uh, we can always pick that one up at the end if you want to carry on. Sure, go ahead. All right, so <clears throat> sometimes we get some um, cases that can contradict themselves a little bit. This one was a um, low power mirror angle horse. So naturally, you know, we kind of want to wedge those up and make sure their tendon surface angle gets better. But sometimes this can, you know, also lead us uh, into a, quarter crack and so a gentleman earlier that asked about a, a quicker way to patch these horses this is exactly what I was referring to um, so again just dremel it out the same kind of approach uh, making sure we've got some copper sulfate and then we've got a drain sitting in there on top of it um, and without the stitching what we can do is um, just get some some polyvectrin which is like a, a woven uh, product that you know like a, it's almost like Kevlar I guess uh, and impregnate that with the glue. So what I'll generally do is I'll, um, I'll be wearing latex gloves to make sure, you know, I stay as clean as possible and I'll just kind of butter those um, polyvectrin strips on the back of my hand and massage the glue into them and stick them on top. And then I'll wrap them in plastic, um, you know, like a, the same way I would wrap the, um, the indirect shoes on, the cigarette shoes. Um, and what happens then is that basically shrink wraps that polyvectrin back down onto the foot and makes a very, very rigid patch across that quarter crack. What is important though is, you know, we realize that the shoeing prescription for this horse is also going to have to change. We're going to have to deal with one thing at a time. In this case, we're going to have to deal with the quarter crack. And then as time goes on, we're going to have to deal with the low palmar angle later. So because this horse is low palmar angle, like I think some horses grow more in a vertical depth, you know, your low palmar angle horses, they have a tendency to grow more horizontally. So, you know, backing up the toe on these horses is one of the hardest things to do because you don't want to compromise the foot in doing so. So again, you can kind of just see that I've just rounded that toe up the best I can and try to get that foot back in better proportions. And there's uh, the finished product after the drain's been removed and I've got that polyvectrin all nice and kind of basically shrink wrapped onto that foot. This is after the plastic's removed. So it's really important, you know, to get these uh, crack all the patches set it really nicely 
your glue timing is really important. You know, there's a certain, I wait for the glue to go slightly tacky before I put it on the foot and then I wrap it in plastic and kind of shrink it down. Um, I, when I turned up to this horse, I assumed that I was going to be addressing the Palmyre angle problem. So this is a wedged shoe with a heart bar in it, of course. So what I actually did on this side, you can kind of see, I took it to the grinder and I turned the wedge of the shoe into a roller motion mechanic and left uh, the belly of the shoe or the wedge in the center of the foot and then just kind of ground down those branches just to make sure that I wasn't contradicting myself as I went. So it's really important that, you know, our shoeing prescriptions are well thought out. Um, and we're thinking pragmatically and we're thinking ahead of time where if we're going to, if, you know, if we're applying a shoe that is only going to do more harm to, you know, it's important that we, you know, we, we don't do that, of course, um, and find a, a shoeing that is more sustainable um, for these horses. And, you know, that kind of mindset can be found right across uh, all therapeutic shoeing, that it's, it's, and that's, you know, like I said earlier, that's why horseshoeing is so infinitely difficult um, because, you know, there's just so many possible things that can, that can, you know, can sway the shoeing prescription one way or the other. Right, we have a question actually came in right as we uh, moved from the previous case study. <laughs> it, uh, the question was, how does that, how does the orthotic stay on? Uh, you foot pack them in at night. So I would wrap the foot, I'd put the orthotic in, I would wrap it in some vet wrap and then maybe a duct tape patch over the top of that. And they'll stay in quite well like that. You know, you only have to do that, of course, if you're taking them out just to work the horse. Um, you know, you take them out and then you just put them straight back in again. Okay, and on the, <clears throat> on the latest case study, uh, what was the purpose of drilling the toe and making bandsaw cuts in the shoes? Uh, it's that sometimes those shoes can be a little bit difficult to shape. So by putting a bandsaw cut through there, we could kind of get the toe shaped. Um, the uh, aluminum that those shoes are made out is really hard. I think it's T6 or something like that. Um, so they can be a little bit tricky to shape. So sometimes we'll, we'll put little cuts in there or little slits just to make it a little bit easier. In the picture of the roller motion shoe, did you drill and cut the shoe to narrow it or what are we seeing near the toe? I think that's the same. I think we're talking about the same thing as the previous question. Just uh, if there's any changes in the toe, it's, it was exactly the same shoe, uh, just with the wedge turned into a roller motion mechanics. Right, and that's it for the, the questions on this one. <laughs> okay. So here's just a another little short. Um, here's a little chronic founder pony that I've been working on. Um, you know, that I turned up the other day and like, you know, we're absolutely just chronically sore. And, um, you know, presenting in all the ways you would think an abscess would. Um, you know, radiographically, you can see we've got a huge lamella wedge sitting there that we're kind of working on. Um, but the, the point to this case study really is it's around just uh, safely working on these little guys or, or they may be, you know, big horses, you know, like what we're seeing here is just an abscess actually, you know, it was very, very common to get subsolar abscesses that sit underneath the foot here and they're very easy to find. Um, I started to poke around with this horse and I've, I was really struggling to, um, to find the origin of the abscess, you know, with the lameness, the way it was, we shot a radiograph and we could see it just sitting off the lamella bed. So I think we've had some, you know, like just some leakage from the lamella and it's possibly gone necrotic on us. So once we had the radiograph, I could locate it, and I got some drainage there. Um, but, you know, it's the great thing about using a radiograph to find these little abscesses is the amount of damage that we actually do to the hoof capsule can be minimized. Um, so easy to go through a foot and kind of rip it to bits and be like, yeah, I found the abscess, but the aftermath of what you've done can be significant. So um, here's just a few minutes later after, you know, like using the diagnostics. Sure, we're not 100%. Um, you can see he's busted his head still. He really didn't like that. Huh? When we did find it, the gas pocket hissed really well. Um, but then so really what it is, you know, part two of this little case study is just how would we negotiate that when we use, you know, like this horse is in, you know, like a treatment plate kind of style shoe to, you know, 
uh, with a wedge with some impression material sitting in the back to try and offset some of these um, the the lamella wedge from the laminitis that we're seeing. You know, like with the radiograph as well, it gave me the information I needed to get after the toes a little. Um, but then, you know, you know, when we're gluing, it's so important that you know that the gluing protocol should be as stringent as a nailing protocol. So what I did there was I removed the cuff away from the toe and the lamella wedge just to make sure that we had access to this. Or was actually on this foot here, um, access to those regions of the lamella and just make sure if this horse was going to get any necrotic setup that we had access to it without actually taking all the shoe, you know, all these expensive shoes back off. So just a little a little case study about like finding abscess in those lamella wedges and that it's it is something that we do see um, and just ways to navigate around it really. What do you do with uh, hooves that are really overgrown? It, it depends on why they're overgrown. Like a neglect case can be quite easy to, to turn around if it's just, you know, obviously hasn't been trimmed in a long time. When we're dealing with uh, lamella wedges, you know, the lamella wedge is almost like a, a large scar that the uh, lamella sets up. And so just to, to go through it with the rasp and just thin it out, I'm not always convinced that that's the right way to do it. So sometimes, again, it's more of a pragmatic approach uh, for us at the hospital where, you know, we'll just round that toe up, we'll bring horizontally, we'll bring that foot back into proportions, set that foot up and ask, essentially ask it the same question again, as if, if we trim you like this and put the right mechanics on you, will you grow in a, in a more favorable fashion? Um, and quite often the answer, the horse responds with a, you know, yes, I will, I will lay down better foot that way. Um, so sometimes a pragmatic approach to therapeutic shoeing is often the fastest route. No further questions on this section. Okay, so this is the last case study. It's, a, it's kind of like an interesting one, really. Um, it's just a little bit of exposed solicorium. Um, this horse, um, I got asked to come and look at it. I'll just show you the video. of This is what I saw the first morning I went to look at it. You know, really quite crippled lame. You know, it would be consistent with uh, um, an abscess. Um, so the reason I'm bringing up this case study is sometimes we just have to be careful that we don't <clears throat> bracket our horses into like, oh, it's probably just an abscess or maybe it's a, a stone bruise. You know, sometimes we've got to think outside the box and just, and just be really thorough with our examinations. And what it was is um, this horse m might have stood on something in the field. It could have, I, you know, it could have done a, a lot of different things. But when I cleaned the foot, there was a little bit of necrotic kind of tissue sitting in the air. And I flicked the top off that kind of necrotic sole tissue on the inside of the bar. And it was this piece of um, exposed solicorium. Just, and, you know, like, it would be so easy to browse over this. And, you know, this horse obviously has some confirmation issues um, that influence the inside of this horse's foot. Um, we can see, you know, like, this horse kind of struggles with good uh, sole integrity on the inside of the foot, much better on the lateral side. But this is like an inward rotation of the um, left front that essentially puts that medial heel right under the line of force from the limb across the top. So I think what was happening is this inside of the foot, you know, some other horses wouldn't have a problem with this little bit of exposed corium, uh, but with the confirmation it created a pinching effect for this horse. So <clears throat> putting the pieces together of a therapeutic shoeing prescription, you know, I needed, I know that I needed to float that inside heel. Um, so I needed some kind of heart bar support. The uh, wall quality wasn't that great on the medial aspect. This mare previously had problems keeping shoes on when I first met her. She, the coffin bone, she wasn't laminitic, but just like retracted soles. Um, so, you know, she, this mare, her whole history is based around the inward rotation of the fetlock and, and just poor wall quality. Um, so on top of that, I, I know that I needed a treatment plate to reverse the ground reaction forces that we were talking about earlier. So same kind of setup, you know, you want to float that inside medial heel. Um, I've gone and, you know, treated all these areas of the foot with copper sulfate and some glue that, you know, are compromised by necrotic tissue. You can see that I've even put some down the, the sulcus of the frog here, but certainly not, no copper sulfate over the exposed scolicarium because we could end up with a chemical burn. So it's important that topically we're also mindful, 
you know, this case study is starting to push more into the vet farrier thing a little bit where, you know, you could easily end up um, needing a veterinarian on this case. So applying these shoes, you know, pretty simple when you've got your treatment plate, of course, you've got a little screw hole sitting under here. You want to protect those when you glue. Um, you set your foot up and then once you've got the shoe on top of it, I would, what I did here was um, I put some impression material over the, the hole where the um, corium was exposed and then poured some pore and orthotic on top of it. And what that does is that's going to seal the foot up, but leave me an area where I can topically treat this because we're going to have to be careful as we do that. So what I did was, um, this is probably a better picture showing it. So I've poured my uh, pore and orthotic over the top of the heart bar and then I've got gauze soaked in um, a 1% iodine. If we're going to use iodine on exposed uh, dermises, we need to be careful of the strength of it. Like, there's certainly not one of those things where if a little is good, more is better. We need to, you know, we want to make sure that these um, <clears throat> problems like this in the bottom of the horse's foot heal from the inside out. We don't end up with a crust over the top of them. We want to settle them down nicely. And then the treatment plate would go over the top of that. So I'll take the treatment plate off, pull my gauze, and I've got access. Uh, I'm also floating that inside heel quarter with my heart bar. Uh, with a pore and orthotic, I've got the area isolated away from further bacteria. So, you know, <clears throat> when we start breaking these therapeutic shoeing prescriptions down, we, it should be a logical way we get to this. You know, do I need to load shear? Yes, I do. Do I need to isolate the dermal structure so I can topically treat it? Yes, I do. Uh, to make this horse comfortable, I need to reverse ground reaction force. So all of a sudden, all these things we've been talking about during this webinar start stacking up. Um, when, um, you know, when I've got a horse this lame, I'm also very cautious about the opposing limb, supporting limb, limb the last thing we'd want would be supporting limb laminitis. So, you know, I start load shearing that foot as well. Very, very easy to do with these indirect cuffs. You know, she's so sore on the left front, she wasn't going to stand long. Again, a really good use of these shoes because you can, you know, um, impregnate that cuff with glue, put it on, wrap it in plastic, and have it down on the ground again within 20 seconds. So a wonderful thing for really, really sore horses, and then just a little bit more of a load shearing capacity with the pore and uh, orthotic on there as well. Really important with these shoes that you know the cuffs are great. We re recruit the wool structure. Um, but it also make sure that the cuff is away from the hairline. Uh, once you've done a few of these, you can kind of get them looking pretty nice. Uh, this is four weeks later. I came back and had another look at the ho this horse um, to reevaluate. You know, was certainly, you know, the hole was epithelialized. We're starting to shut in. You know, they've obviously taken, you know, their advice, the advice I gave them well. They were treating it with gauze. I think I checked this horse a couple of times in between shoeings as well. Um, at one point I had to reattach the treatment plate for them, but no big deal, you know, um, but certainly the foot, that little spot's doing a lot better. So the question from them was after the history of um, uh, this horse's past with the confirmation and, and the simple fact that she loved that treatment plate, like she had probably been the soundest she had been in a long time. I was like, well, what do we do? How do we, how do we get around this? So I was like, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could put a heart bar shoe with a permanent treatment plate. This is after, of course, that I'm, I'm comfortable that the um, exposed Corian's taken care of. Um, so this is the shoe um, Manuel Cruz. He's one of our fabricators at the clinic that I kind of went in and I was like, hey, Manuel, this is, this is what I need. What can we do? Um, and he just did a wonderful job at fabricating the shoe. These are series three cuff. Essentially, this, the shoe is welded and just bolted together. We bolted in the heart bar. We're gonna glue on indirectly. That allows me to load the frog a little, float the inside medial quarter. Um, again, I'm gonna approach the setup the same. I'm gonna float that quarter. Uh, and here's it installed. What I did was uh, um, the, the heart bar contact on the frog was just right. It was just sitting wonderfully neutral. So I drilled a hole and reverse poured the pore and orthotic, um, which I do a lot. I find I get a lot more material sitting under even my leather pads. If I, if I do a reverse pour, I just keep pouring it in here until it kind of bubbles out the back. Uh, when I take off like the shoe or it's, I just seem to be getting a lot more material into these, um, these feet like that. But this mirror, 
she went on. She again, she loved this shoe. Um, here's just a few weeks later, you know, doing really well, but you can see that confirmation on that left front kind of working against her. So we had to have a good talk about what we can expect from this mare. She's a super nice mare. Um, but with her confirmation and the way her feet are, um, you know, she's a possible um, broodmare project in the near future because we're continually having these problems. But there's a logical reason for it, you know. Limb conformation is affecting hoof conformation. Hoof conformation starts to deteriorate, and then we have ground reaction force problems. So, you know, once we truly appreciate conformation and how it affects the limb and all the other opposing forces around, you know, the limb and therapeutic shoeing, it certainly makes um, figuring these cases out a lot easier. If there's any questions, yeah, is there an advantage to um, the treatment plate and your, and your use of the uh, screws that are flush instead of bolts that would stand out? Yeah, it depends on the application and whether the horse is turned out with others. Um, we typically don't use bolts. Um, I mean, if the horse is isolated on its own, I think you'd be fine. Of course, you may need the traction. Um, so again, case-by-case case scenario where only that practitioner at that time could really make a call on whether they needed bolts or screws. Did you trim the glue away from the hairline or is that a nice clean line or, or was the nice clean line just from taping the coronary band? I taped it and then I'll go in with my rasp afterwards and lower any glue back down. It's something I check if I'm using an indirect method of, of shoeing like that, I will, um, I'll always kind of glance up the front of the foot and just see what that cuff is going to communicate with. If it's too high, believe me, if it's too high, it's easy to cut it before <laughs> than after. Okay. Now we have a few other questions that not, aren't related to the case study. Um, we have a farrier who has a uh, club foot stage one. It contracts in winter months, opens up to ground uh, frog contact in the summer. It's a, uh, 14 year old barefoot horse and it's sound. Um, and uh, it's on uh, soil and soft grassland. Uh, the, there's regular work on the back of the foot for, in four week intervals. And uh, as the foot grows in a, at a faster rate, the toe is only rolled but leveled flat to the apex of the frog. And the heels are taken down to a card space to the ground at a 30 degree angle to open up the contracted frog. Do you have any advice on these types of club feet in relation to uh, the bars in relation to the back of the foot and uh, frog management? It's, it's really uh, difficult to kind of comment too much without seeing it. It sounds like, you know, this foot is uh, being looked after, you know, quite well. Um, what I do suggest is, um, you know, when we start, dropping the heels of club feet, just be careful that we understand that the, you know, the chances of actually, you know, like Dr. Redden puts it really well where the, your club footed horses have a high suspension of the deep digital flex tendon. So it, it's basically in a state of contracture. So the tendons aren't capable of contraction, but the muscle group is. So, you know, when we're trying to influence the muscle group from three and four feet away, you know, as a vertical height, it's, it's very, very tricky. So I'm very cautious about um, challenging club feet. Uh, and that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to comment too much without seeing it. But I mean, if they would like to send some pictures to the clinic, um, you could get my email address through the Farrier's Journal and um, we could communicate about it. Uh, in reference to case number one, given that the hoof is loading asymmetrically, when would you consider an asymmetrical shoe? It's really tr uh, tricky with asymmetrical shoes because, you know, generally when we're trimming the, the horse, um, we want it, you know, medial laterally landing even. And the minute we put on an asymmetric shoe, we're basically, upon landing, we're pushing that horse into a, out of balance almost. So it depends on the, the substrate that the horse is working in the majority of the time. So a lot of the shoeing prescriptions, I think it's important that, you know, we never, unless they standardized all the surfaces that these horses are working on, it's very, very difficult to say 
you know, which surface is best or how, how that shoe is going to, to work in different surfaces. Um, a lot of the time, if the, you know, the uh, limb conformation is going to sway me, um, limb conformation gives me a lot of answers. And I, I'm really, I'm quite big on um, watching these horses travel before I shoe them. Because like I said earlier, it's like when we see a horse statically to dynamically, we start to see the kinematic phases of, of movement and that can really change the whole picture for us. So again, it's, uh, I can't give you a definite answer there because it, there's so many variables that come into play. Great. Um, <clears throat> have you ever experienced what seems to be soul and walls seemingly blend together with no white line defining the two? Uh, this is a new, new horse that uh, is being shod uh, only the second time, and she has a very interesting left front foot. The white line seems to disappear about the toe quarter and reappear roughly at the heel quarter, and she is dis disproportionate laterally. Uh, she's sound, not reacted to hoof testers, and unfortunately there are no x-rays. Uh, this is the one that I sent the photo to you. Yeah, um, so I have seen the photograph of this horse and it's, you know, the wonderful thing about photographs for a farrier is you can tell so much more. Um, and it was a good photograph. Uh, I think uh, I'd be looking into the horse's history. I don't think so much the white line disappearing. What I saw was possible coffin bone displacement and immediately I'd be shooting a radiograph to see if this horse had sunk medially in its past. Now, it could have been years ago that this did it. So um, the other thing it could have been is I've seen um, one of my horses that I shoe uh, had part of its collateral cartilage removed and it come up with significant scarring um, through the solar region like this also, this horse also had. So to give the other listeners a kind of idea of what it looked like was um, almost like a, a very tightly wound lamella wedge on the medial aspect of the foot. So it looks like the white line blends out, but in actual fact, I think it's just a very, very distorted lamella junction through that area. So there could be a few things. Um, I mean, there could also, hopefully for the owner, there's nothing wrong. Um, there could also be a keratoma sitting in there when we see changes of soul tissue like that. Um, so there's a few options, but uh, I would really highly recommend a, um, a radiograph and just see if, to see what's going on in there. Um, it'll be the quickest way. And sometimes I find that with clients as well, like they will, they'll put a certain amount of money towards therapeutic shoeing um, and hoping that I, I might get lucky or we could just like the horse with the navicular with the impar ligament strain went straight to MRI and we had that case rehabilitated so much quicker because we had all the information. Um, and so, and I understand that of course it's, it's a case by case and sometimes finances don't allow it, but I do see some cases that get drip fed um, and it ends up costing the client a lot more money. Great. Well, that's the end of uh, the questions. Um, so I, we want to thank uh, Stuart and Sound Horse Technologies once again. You can learn more about Sound Horse's products at soundhorse.com. If you've missed any of this webinar or would like to rewatch it, please, please uh, keep an eye out on your email and the AFJ new e newsletter for more information or visit AmericanFarriers.com after 7 p.m. to find the video, 7 p.m. tomorrow to find the video. On behalf of Stuart Muir, Sound Horse Technologies and American Farriers Journal, thank you for joining us for the webinar. Please feel free to reach out to let us know what you thought of the live event and if there are any topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Thanks again and have a great night. Thank you.